Hi, everybody. Uh, John and Brian. Um, it's interesting times we live in. It's been a quite a volatile 2022, but as we were talking just a little while ago, I think we're getting more and more used to the volatility, especially over the last uh, four years or so. Yep. Uh, just to give you kind of a way of a background, Brian and I both are on the investment committee here at Corda with uh, Bonner and uh, Jason Yakabuchi. We've both been with the firm over 10 years. I've been about 11. And Brian just celebrated 11 years about a week ago. I'm I'm almost 12 years with the firm and it's business as usual, even though the market's volatile and uh, things evolve uh, quickly. And we've gone from uh, a pandemic uh, market in 2020 to fears of high interest rates in a recession in 2022. Uh, and on top of that, even if you go back to 2018, there was a real fast uh, 20 percent uh, correction in the fourth quarter of 2018. So we've had quite a bit of volatility since late 2018. Uh, but we want to put all that in perspective. We're hoping to educate uh, you today. We're going to remind you of some of our market uh, principles and hopefully keep you keep you invested, keep you engaged, keep you on the right side of this market. Uh, we have some prepared remarks uh, uh, and some slides to share with you again, just to, to really make you feel comfortable, hopefully. And then uh, we'll have a little bit of a round table and address some of the questions that we've already, that we've already received. And again, if you have some additional ones, be sure to uh, type them out and we'll try to get to them. I'm going to launch into a, a slideshow just where you could see it on your full screen. Uh, again, uh, these commentaries are a narrative. They are not a market forecast. Uh, we do not necessarily have an outlook on the market as we think it's more useful to try to understand what is going on than trying to predict what is going to happen. We do not have a crystal ball. <laughs> I wish we did, but we don't. Uh, the future is about probabilities and the current situation is about facts and interpretations. Nobody has privileged access to the future and market forecasts tend to be about as accurate as calling a coin toss. So, What's really interesting, I noticed this, uh, and for those of you who had the pleasure of joining our webinar about a month or so ago with uh, author Morgan Housel, uh, one of his quotes I think is very apropos uh, as we look at the current market environment. And he said, all past declines look like an opportunity, all future declines look like risk. I bet that's how a lot of you are feeling right now. It's easy to look back in time and all those little down squiggles on a graph and you think, oh, that was a good time to get invested. But when you're living through it, it's a little more scarier and you're probably more hesitant about getting invested or staying invested. Uh, <laughs> I'm reusing some slides, but hopefully some of you have seen these. Uh, we, we put these out sometimes in our quarterly updates. Uh, in previous uh, market discussions like this, I, I tend to drag out some of my favorites and as we know, uh, real life is not linear. Uh, real life and life in the capital markets is very complicated. Uh, this is not normal. This is normal. And that applies to the markets. Uh, life, life, sports, you sports name uh, raising children. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And I think what's really important to us as investors is to know what you control. And again, in life, so much is out of our control, but when it comes to the market, there are a few things that you can control. And that's the risk, the cost, the time, and your behavior. The behavior is the most important factor, I believe, in this, in this uh, schematic. Of course, what we focus most of our time on is on the right-hand side of your screen, it's the return. I think we focus, uh, investors focus, uh, the human nature is to focus on um, how much upside is there, and you don't really necessarily think about the downside. It's only how much can I make. It's that it's that greed. Uh, but the reality is, is that's something that's completely out of our control. And what's what we can control really predominantly is our behavior. Uh, successful investors, time and time again, uh, have more success when they control their emotions, especially going through down markets. Uh, the urge to sell becomes greater when prices are down, and it's exactly reversed as how we want you to think about it. 
uh, when, when prices are down, you should be considering uh, the, the purchasing aspect of securities on sale, but most investors unfortunately are, are thinking about somehow doing something other than uh, being a buyer and they tend to think more about selling when things get tough. Yeah. I would argue too, that if, if you focus on those first four, and you know, put some effort there that you, you, you know, you, you don't know exactly what your return will be, but I think you're going to have a lot more success with your return. If you're, you know, managing your risk properly, managing your cost, time in the market and you know, behaving rationally. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I just, I just did this update over the weekend and we're coming through quarter one earnings, which have been pretty good. So uh, 458 of 500 companies in the S&P 500 have reported. 77% have reported uh, surprises to the upside. Earnings are up 9.2% from a year ago. And revenues are up 12% uh, versus a year ago. And this is far outperforming the consensus. So the fundamental story looks pretty good. But remember, the stock market is not the economy. Uh, and so we have a, a stock market that's in decline in 2022, even though the fun fundamentals remain on track. So we'll get into the, the psychology of that in a second. But keep in mind, right now, things look pretty good, but the market might be warning us. And it's pretty obvious when, the, when Jay Powell says, I'm going to be raising interest rates, and interest rates have gone up quite a bit in the last six months, that the Fed is trying to engineer a slowdown. It's, it's kind of the exact opposite of what we saw maybe in 2020, where we, we shut an economy down. Um, we saw you know, significant declines in, in some of these earnings, but in the, market in the second boom. half of 2020, the market was booming. So there you go. It's like a tale of two, tale of both sides of the coin. Uh, guys, we want you to always remember that these pullbacks are normal. Um, in fact, if we hit that 20% pullback number, can you believe it happens almost once every four years? Uh, that's startling, but I think we tend to forget because every time we live through a 20% decline, uh, we feel like we, it's, we've never had it before, but it's once every four years. Uh, and the 10% corrections are even are, are more, more periodic, really two out of every three years. And even just 5% five, 5 wiggles happen almost every year on balance and got we and we've we've discussed this in the past so this is this is a chart that we like to drag out once or twice a year most of you have seen this if you keep track of uh, some of our quarterly updates but this is the stock market the s p 500 uh going back to 1980 and the the green the green uh, uh dots represent the full year calendar year return so back in 1980 the market returned 26%. Uh, last year, the market returned 27%. That's the full calendar year return. The red or maroon dots represent the intra-year decline. So that maximum decline that happened during the year, although the market finished positive. So again, let me remind you an easy way of looking at it. It's a 1987 crash. Um, on October 19th of 87, the market was down 21% in that one day but its full drawdown during October, November was 34%. But had you been invested for that entire year, so you were just fully invested, you lived through the drawdown, the S&P 500 returned 2%. So that's how you have to view this, this chart is you're getting these pretty dramatic drawdowns, but 70% of the time the market finishes positive. And the reason we bring this chart up is because the the average of all these red or maroon dots is about 14%. That's the average intra-year drawdown going back to 1980. Yep. And today we're, last week we hit around 19% on the S&P 500. The NASDAQ is down over 30%. Uh, but generally speaking, these aren't completely abnormal numbers when you look back in time in terms of the, the average yearly drawdown. I mean, we under we understand that just because they're normal, they're not they're not fun. But um, again, if we control our behavior through these not fun time periods, and you know we do the right thing, we sh we should be able to um, achieve decent results. And if and if average is like fifteen percent, and we're the S and P, when I say we're, that's the S and P is down twenty. Corda is far outperforming uh, the stock market, no matter how you measure it. 
Uh, but that's when you want to be thinking, wow, we've had, we've hit those declines. You want to be thinking more of a, a buyer as opposed to being a seller. You want to be taking advantage of things that are on sale. Um, so, and guys, I can make all these slides available to you. Uh, I brought this one out over the weekend. It's something actually my, when she was a teenage daughter of mine, uh, this goes back, I had to look back. It's about five years old. Uh, on an index card, we came up with this, a market crash on a card. So it's a very quick and easy, put it on your refrigerator door uh, that will help you kind of manage around typical market uh, volatility. And if you go back to that previous slide up here, it kind of measures the same kind of things that are talked about there, where markets average one 14% annual decline, uh, daily, daily dips of 2% or more occur five times a year. We've had a lot of 2% <laughs> declines, positive or negative, just in the last month or two. But every five years, you get a market that declines 30%. Uh, but guess what? Markets rise almost 75% of the time. Uh, over this is a key point right now for where we are today. Over long periods, markets significantly beat inflation. We will come back to that quite a bit in the next 20 or so minutes. Selling low and buying high never works. Turn off the TV and don't check your account. It's, it's hard these days because your account can be right on your phone. But just like we remind people, you don't check your the value of your home on a daily or weekly basis, you almost have to treat your assets in your brokerage account similarly. They're assets, they're not pieces of paper. Uh, the less you look, uh, the stronger mentally you will be. Yeah, uh, we, I rarely watch CNBC, but every, every now and then I'll flip it on and it, it takes about five or 10 minutes for me to already start getting anxiety. So, um, you know, there. Uh, it's, it's full of scare tactics. So there you go. Never make important decisions based on emotion. <laughs> These are the facts. Everything else is a scare tactic. Thank you to the teenager for writing those things for us. Again, please ask me if you like that. I could send it out to you. It's great for the refrigerator door. Uh, so remember the, uh, the definitions of what a correction is and what a bear market is, just to talk about it for a second. Uh, Somewhere back in time, somebody put definitions to what a 10% decline is. So they, they call a 10% decline, but less than 20% a correction. And the minute you hit over 20%, again, in the broad market, it's officially a bear market. So somebody drew those arbitrary numbers. Uh, I would say, and we literally almost kissed the bear market last week, but we didn't necessarily hit that minus 20. We would argue that, guys, we're in a bear market. Yeah. It's there's a lot of stocks with far greater declines in 20%. So the S&P 500 is flirting with that 20%, but the NASDAQ is flirting closer to 33, 34% off its highs. And I bet many of you know of some of these businesses, especially the growth oriented companies, uh, a lot of them have gotten decimated. I bet if you were to look through this list of stocks that Again, back to the 2020 pandemic boom, some of these went up a lot, but a lot of them give them given a lot of it back. Uh, if you were to look closely on here, you'll recognize some of these uh, Peloton, Zoom, DraftKings, Lemonade, the insurance company, Twilio, Block, C3 AI, Chewy, DocuSign, Shopify, Zillow. I know you I know many of you have heard about these companies. These stocks have gotten taken to the woodshed. So we'd argue that whether you define it by 20% as a bear, there's been stocks that have been in the bear market since last year. Yeah, and you, you don't even have to dive this deep into the, uh, the growth category to find you know, businesses that are in that bear market. Even, even household names like Amazon and Google are down 40% from their highs. So, um, you know. There, there's sect areas of the market that have, have, to John's point, really been taken to the woodshed. Again, and that, guys, and that might be where the opportunity lies. We'll get back to that in a second. So as you know, at Corda, dividends are really important to our total return. We've got two engines pulling ourselves uh, to future success. The capital appreciation obviously is one engine, but the dividends, the locomotive of our total return is the dividends that we're receiving each and every month or each and every quarter, 
And more importantly, the, those dividends that are going up on a yearly basis. Most of the companies we own have a track record of raising dividends year in and year out. And that's really important to us, especially as we're trying to uh, cope with inflation. Uh, this is the S&P 500 since uh, inception. And it's just sharing with you uh, the level of total return in each decade that may come from dividends or may come from price appreciation. Let me focus on the 70s. What that 72% number means is during the high inflationary 70s, 72% of your total return came from the dividends alone. So much less from a capital appreciation standpoint for that whole decade, majority of your return was from the dividends. But if you look at going back in time, uh, the numbers average out to about 42% of your return is from dividends and the rest is from capital appreciation. Most investors completely discount or not even take into account the dividend returns. Everybody focuses on price appreciation or price depreciation, <laughs> but the dividends are really vital to how we believe and think about the market. So as, an, as a couple of examples, because we really want to drive this home to you guys that the dividends, the big locomotive of your total return is going to come from the dividends and rising dividends. So the best way to beat inflation is to have an asset that gives you more cash flow every year. So as you know, if you buy bonds, uh, the minute you buy a bond, you get locked into the income stream. It doesn't change. You buy a 10-year treasury, you get your money back in 10 years, and it pays a stated amount of interest. There's, there's no upside to that. Um, the good news is with dividends and dividend rising businesses, is that that cash flow just keeps coming in and it keeps going up every year. And what's really important about this theory and part of our strategy is that regardless of what the central bank might be doing, what politicians might be doing, uh, the economy in an expansion or a recession, if you have an asset that's cash flowing more and more every single year, or maybe there's a year or two the cash flow is staying steady, but then in year three it pays you more. But let's assume you've got an asset. Here, of course, we're talking about common stocks, but just think of it as an asset that has higher and higher cash flow. That's going to pull the share price higher. Capitalism will be broken if you had something kicking off higher and higher levels of cash each and every year for that for that value of that asset to decline. So we know if we buy and identify good quality businesses that in five or 10 years are going to be paying us a lot more cash than they are today, inherently, it's just going to pull the share price higher. Yeah. Regardless of wars, regardless of what the economy is doing in real time, uh, regardless of interest rates that are high or interest rates that are low, that asset is going to appreciate. Yeah. So, so what this chart is really showing is if we took a million dollars back in 2012, we put it into... We, we you know bought a quarter portfolio, put it into a little black box. And the only thing that came out of that black box for the next 10 years was dividends. First year, it'll be 32,000, then thir almost 34, so on and so forth, all the way to last year paying us $64,000. Um, you know, now, now let's say we went in and opened up that black box and looked at all those stocks. If, if, if it's paying us twice the amount of cash flow. I don't know that that million dollars is, has doubled necessarily in that box, but it's definitely worth more than a million dollars today. Guys, and, and frankly, this is a, if you look in the, the small print on the bottom, it's a large cap consumer staples company. Since, you, since we're all clients on this call, that is Coca-Cola. <laughs> the beauty of Coca-Cola from 10 years ago is, again, this is just assuming we put all million dollars into Coke. It gave you $472,000 of dividends credited back to your account. So that's not even in keeping in mind what the value of the shares would be worth, but you got almost half your investment back via dividends alone. But this isn't just, uh, I'm not just picking on Coca-Cola as a great example. Uh, down here is a large cap industrial company. <laughs> well, they make tractors, they make green <laughs> tractors. You put a million dollars into the green tractor company. Now, 10 years ago, that initial dividend was 27,000. It was about a 2.7% yielding business at that time. 
Uh, and here's a case in point where we had flat dividends for a few years, 15, 16, 17, dividends stayed the same. And then they jumped it up again. Again, but you're getting from the green tractor company almost $400,000 of dividends in the last 10 years. And it's not telling you at all where the share price has grown to. Uh, one last example, uh, one of our favorite banks, this is US Bank. Uh, it's a very similar story. You've gotten uh, steady dividend increases for the last decade. Uh, that million dollars returned 441,000 in cash alone. And the share price has done very well. This is what we're trying to identify, not only in the 2022 market environment, but in the 1998 market environment, the 2005 market environment, it's going to be in the 2025 market environment. I've talked for a long time in our letters that envision yourself five years from now or envision yourself looking at a chart like this 10 years from now, your 2032 self. If you could go buy some assets today, what will your 2032 self say to you 10 years from now? We want them to be thank, you know, <laughs> patting you on the back saying, you bought some great assets at some good prices and look at the cash flow that's returned to me over 10 years. It doesn't have to be 10 years, it could be five years. We think if you identify good quality businesses that have the propensity to give us some more cash flow, the share price will reflect that at some point in the future. It, we don't know about tomorrow, we don't know about next week, but we're pretty confident the share price will reflect the success of the business in due time. Okay, and just as a, as a recap, um, what's really good about dividends too is the passive income. So again, it's, these aren't slips of paper. We are, we are taking ownership positions in what we believe to be wonderful companies and it keeps us locked in. Uh, the minute you sell, that income goes away. Uh, and even the banks still aren't paying us or the brokerage firms are not paying us on money market. Even though interest rates are moving up, we're still getting virtually nothing on our cash balances. So the, de the decision to sell is a, is a grave decision that starts to trickle down and have a domino effect in a lot of other things. So it keeps you invested. When, when I own the green tractor company or US Bank or Coca-Cola, it just keeps me invested because I know every 90 days, cash is hitting my account. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly what we believe to be, and we'll get into this in the Q&A in a second, it's clearly what we believe to be the, the best inflation protection out there. You, with bonds, you're not getting any inflation protection. Uh, hopefully with some real estate holdings, whether it's your own home or we own some real estate investment trusts, we think th that's good inflation protection. But those are all the same thing too. Those REITs are providing us steady income and rising income. And that all works in our favor, in our view. And so it keeps you invested. You're collecting profits. It keeps you from uh, doing something drastic. And point number four, a cushion against market risk. You guys are seeing that in real time. Uh, the quarter portfolio is, does not have the downside volatility that the broad market has. If we went back to that list of all those growth stocks that are down 70 or 80 or 90%, the, the vast majority don't pay any dividends at all. The dividend stream keeps investors uh, in the game and it keeps big institutional investors, uh, when they sell all that high growth and they, and they need to stay invested, they gravitate towards the dividend paying equities. And for, and for every dollar decline in a dividend paying stock, you're buying higher yield. So assuming the dividend hasn't, hasn't changed, if the market comes in 10% on dividend paying stocks, you're getting that much more dividend yield at that lower price point. So there's a big cushion for dividend paying equities. And again, any company that can pay a dividend consistently year over year over year, to us, that's a clear sign of good corporate discipline and excellent financial health. The, the board of directors has to make sure the company stays on track. Uh, if you have a, a track record of 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 50 years of paying dividends, it means you've got to manage the, the business uh, conservatively. Jeff, I want to take a pause. We kind of ran through maybe 25 minutes right there. So. Yeah. Why don't we hit some Q&A and then I've got some additional charts if we have time or else we'll just handle a lot of the questions. Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. No questions at this point uh, from the 
audience, uh, but I've got a couple that were pre-submitted. And just a quick reminder for those of you listening, if you would like to ask a question of John or Brian, kind of hover over, hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen. You should be a little icon that says Q&A. Just type it right in there and I'll try to ask the, the guys of, uh, of the question. So a couple of pre-submitted and Brian, I'll start with you. John touched on this uh, with his uh, long list of growth stocks that are have just been decimated. Um, those are down a lot and, and certainly probably not the pond that Corda would fish in. <laughs> but, but do you see any opportunities on maybe some um, quality growth stocks that are down? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, we're not afraid to buy, to buy growth stocks. We're not afraid to buy tech stocks, but we want to make sure that we're getting an appropriate price. Um, we're not willing to pay more than they're worth. We want to discount just like we would buying value stocks and dividend paying stocks. And so, um, I do think there is some opportunity, um, you know, back in 2018, December of 2018, there was a pretty big market sell off and it was led by the tech. And we did for, for select accounts come in and buy some, um, some Apple and some Google at that time. And right now, I think, you know, again, Google may be presenting itself as an opportunity, even something like Amazon may be presenting itself as an opportunity. So um, we, we, we typically are going to be careful about where we, where we buy those. And we're probably not going to buy a huge part of a portfolio in that just because of the, uh, the lack of dividends. But um, certainly, certainly it's, we're, we're starting to look in that sandbox to play. Hey, Jeff, you, the audience probably can't necessarily see, but over the, our shoulders, we have some quotes on uh, the wall. And for those clients who've had the good fortune of visiting us, um, and they've come down to the, this is called the portfolio room or the portfolio team room. It's, it's a whole, it's a, it's many quotes, mostly from Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, but you know, we view, you know, we're talking value and growth, but our mindset is we want all of our companies to be growing. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily like to delineate as many investors do grow stocks, value stocks, large stocks, small stocks, that sort of thing. We want, we want everything to be growing. And generally speaking, most of our companies pay dividends. So they'll, they'll share some of those profits via, via dividends. But some of these traditional, as mentioned, uh, Alphabet, or Apple, in Apple's case, they do pay a little dividend. Um, you know, we're going to still focus predominantly because we got those two engines. I want capital appreciation, but we do want some cash flow coming in. We'll we'll focus a big amount on uh, dividend paying equities, but there, there will be out. And I think we're seeing a market that's pre presenting some additional opportunities right now with some maybe not normal quarter type businesses, but. We feel that if the price is right, if that if we feel like we're getting some great value on a business that doesn't pay a dividend, there still could be a place for it in the portfolio. Yeah, that makes sense. Let, let's talk about dividends for a second. I, I certainly the majority of of core to clients. I, I would I would guess a majority on this call today uh, need or 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 will in the near future rely on income from their portfolio. You touched on, both you guys touched on uh, dividends being a key part of that, uh, being a nice inflation hedge. Maybe, John, I'll start with you to ask a, a two-part question. Um, it is it Maybe first part is a recession. We, we cannot go through a day without recession talk, even if you don't watch CNBC. Um, and so uh, maybe from your perspective, John, I'll start with you on uh, what are the odds, for lack of a better term, of a recession? And then maybe specifically for us at Corda and our clients, um, if we do have a recession, do you anticipate that interrupting the dividend income flow? Good stuff. Good I, think we'll, I think we'll both handle this. So we, we do at Corda think the odds are material that we're headed to a recession or, I know this may sound crazy, pardon. we could be in a recession right now and we don't even know it. So remember the earlier slide, the economy is not the stock market. So, wow, there's a lot of ways we could go through this discussion. <laughs> so one, the Fed has already done two interest rate hikes. They're probably gonna come right back with two additional 50 basis point increases. The, the Fed's mindset right now, Jay Powell is like, 
I need to slow aggregate demand. I need to bring inflation down. It is running too hot. They've gotten very hawkish about it. It's, it's flipped from a year ago. So their mindset is to maybe force this uh, economy into a recession. They could talk all day about a soft landing and making sure GDP doesn't go negative. Although even we had a first quarter print GDP that was negative, that may be some special factors. But right now, it sounds like the Fed may be willing to put us in a recession. So I think we have to be mindful that that's certainly a, a legitimate high material probability. All that said, and we'll get to the dividends in a second, but all that said, remember, this, the stock market will, will rally well before the recession uh, ends. I mean, the market is always getting, the market is always 12 months ahead of itself. So the market may have just priced in the fact that we're, we're headed to a recession. Again, look, some of these stocks have been decimated. So the market may have already done the work of Jay Powell. Interest rates have gone up quite a bit already, even though we've only had two, two interest rate increases thus far. So all re recessions may happen. That's actually the normal cyclical part of the economy. Uh, I think we have to brace for them. The stock market goes down 20 to 30% every five years. Uh, all this stuff is kind of natural. So we're, we're bracing for it ourselves. And then we think about those dividends a lot. And I think yeah. Brian. Well, first I'll touch on the recession a little bit too. Um, you know, the question we, we, we get occasionally is why, why not sell? If, if you think a recession is likely, well, historically a recession, during a recession, the stock market sells off about 30%. Sounds really scary, it is pretty scary, but we're already down 20%. So that, that doesn't mean another 30% from today necessarily. It means top to bottom, historically, it's about 30%. So we're already two thirds of the way there. Um, also, the we don't have to go there. NASDAQ's already there. Um, typically that's gonna be led by more of your, your you know, non-dividend paying, maybe higher growth trajectory businesses. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I just, I don't think it's a great time to sell for us. Even if there is a recession, I think the downside could still be fairly limited from here if there's a recession, you know, not guaranteed, but possible. Um, go ahead, Jeff. And Brian, just to piggyback on that, do you anticipate it? it let's say whatever a garden variety recession is uh, definition would you anticipate any interruption in the dividend flow uh, for, from the from the average quarter of portfolio? Yeah, that's a, that's that's a great that's a great question. I was about to touch on that. Um, so, you know, again, historically, the businesses we're buying have paid dividends in some cases for a hundred years consecutive. Um, we do a lot of research. We spend a lot of our brain power on those dividends, on the safety of those dividends. Um, so I'll use an example when, when COVID reared its head in you know, February and March of 2020, um, we really looked at all of our businesses and said, which of our businesses you know, in the face of an economy being shut down, um, which, which of these businesses have the um, you know, risk of, of dividend cut, dividend reduction, dividend suspension? Um, we identified about 12 businesses that we thought could reduce their dividends. Um, it ended up being only four of them did. Uh, one of them did it to buy back shares at a, at a very deep discount, which I think was probably a sound business move. Um, so a typical recession isn't the same as maybe what we saw in March and April, May of 2020, where, where we, we literally just put a halt on the economy. Um, you know, a company like Coca-Cola is, is, is still gonna sell sodas and waters and Fairlife milk and Tropicana orange juice. Um, we think that dividend is safe. We think that those companies will, you know, may, maybe maybe if we hit a recession, they're not going to raise their dividend 7% like they did last year, but maybe they raise it three or four or five. And um, I, I really think the dividend stream is safe. And and that's important if you're if you're a retiree, especially and living off of off of the dividends and we see, you know, the market continue to correct. Um, you know, you're in a great position that you, you don't have to sell to access that cash flow. These dividends will provide that for you. The, the Corda portfolio is chock full of stable, secure businesses. It's our mindset going in is not trying to predict where the economy is going. It's really, truly looking at the fundamentals of the companies we own. And we sort of default to an all weather type portfolio. Yeah. Look at the, we've got consumer staples. We have healthcare companies. We have a lot of very 
inelastic type of business is that the, the demand will always be there, regardless of the type of economic environment we're in. And that's all on purpose. Yeah. A, a quarter portfolio is, is typically going to be a little bit overweight, the consumer staples. And you know, there's there's times that that can be a little bit of a drag on a portfolio when the market is just, you know, screaming hot. Um, that's going to hold the portfolio back a little bit, but but it's there by design. It's there so that when we get in these type of situations, um, you know, where where there's maybe a recession looming, um, where there may be pretty heavy inflation, you know, in the year or two to come, um, that the, these businesses handle that well, right? Um, you know, if we're if we're looking at higher rates and inflation, um, that that shouldn't prevent a, anyone from going out and buying another Coca-Cola or, you know, uh, an Oscar Mayer hot dog, you know, a 10%, <laughs> a 10% um, inflation, you know, raises the price of those by, you know, cents where if you're going, if you're an airline and you're going out to buy a Boeing airplane today and it's a couple hundred million dollars, well, 10% inflation really adds up there. And then add into the, you know, add in the higher borrowing costs to maybe finance that plane. That's where we see some issues, but, um, yeah. our consumer staples should do fairly well. Hey, Jeff, if I could, the, um, sure. I think a good data point is the 2008, 2009, um, recession or, you know, that was a pretty nasty one. And thinking of dividends back then, it was predominantly just the financial service or the banks that had dividend cuts, dividend suspensions, dividends that went to zero, but broadly speaking, you know, pharmaceuticals and, and really the broad consumer staples, most other sectors did not face the brunt of any dividend reductions, but it was predominantly just in that financial banking sector. And I think we would say that today, the banking sector is much more well, well capitalized. The, the banks we own, uh, we feel are very secure. And so you never know where the, the danger might be lying in a portfolio, but our view is that we're we're pretty well invested to have mostly secure dividends, and again, hopefully, a continuation of dividend increases. Well, it's, it speaks to the importance of diversification as well, right? I mean, most clients on this call have a stock portfolio of 25, 20 to thirty individual businesses. So, to that point, uh, we're running out of time. Couple of just let me throw a couple real quick ones at you, quick, maybe quick answers, uh, things that we get a lot from clients, and I think that there's just uh, those that do watch um, business news hear a lot. One of the acronyms that came out of the last couple of years has been uh, TINA, right? There, there are no alternatives. Um, <laughs> there's starting to be some alternatives with rates going up. So maybe just a quick hitter on, uh, is that going to compete, the bonds going to compete with the stock market at all? And maybe just a quick 30 second comment about bonds, because we certainly have clients that have bonds in their portfolio. Yeah, it's actually, you know, for a lot of folks that have been solely, I mean, you think of maybe some of our grandparents who didn't ever get into the equity markets. I'm not speaking about my family. We're big, big <laughs> equity owners, but uh, it's nice for some element of uh, more normal interest rates so they could actually achieve some modest rates of return on their treasuries or CDs. And that's the, the, the interest rate market has moved up where you can now see some, some modest returns, 2%, 3% type returns on quality fixed income and, and more shorter end. So we're, again, we're not using any monies long-term. We're two, three, four-year maturities, and we're starting to see some fairly modest and somewhat meaningful rates of return without much risk. For the first time in years. <laughs> yeah. But that said, Jeff, we're still, you know, it's, the equity market still gives us some good some good yields with rising dividends in future years. So you just have to kind of balance out the two again with, are you happy locking in a two or 3% rate or could you get a two or 3% or more dividend yield today with the potential for it to grow over the next yeah. five and, or 10 and, and years? And not to mention if, if, yeah. you know, if there's concern about inflation going forward, locking in that two to 3% return in your fixed income, you know, you, you may not even be beating inflation at that point. So, you know, there's a place for fixed income in a portfolio, um, depending on risk tolerance and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to fight inflation, I think the, the dividend paying equities are still the way to go. Yeah, great point, Brian. It may, it may be necessary, right? I mean, it may have been a luxury in the past with inflation, the way we've seen it. Uh, maybe it's um, 
maybe it's a necessity. Okay, uh, last question. I kind of don't want to end on this, but we're going to end on this one because it, uh, we always get it, and, and you guys will, will know when I say it. Um, so, so maybe just a couple of, of a quick hit or two, and then we'll wrap. When, if, if at all, would we be sellers? I mean, you, you laid out the case of a potential recession, a bear market, depending on how you define it. When would we, we be it's, sellers at Corda? <laughs> it's fun. It's, it's fundamentally driven. So it's not a macro decision yeah. about we're making a forecast on the S&P 500 or gross domestic product. It's going to be individualistic to the company we own. It'll be Coke or John Deere or U.S. Bank. It's, will there be a change in fundamentals, a, a dramatic change in fundamentals? We might be a seller. Uh, is it possible that the valuation has gotten to an extreme level? We might be a trim, a trimmer. We may not sell outright, but you've seen us over time when a business gets to be highly valued relative to itself or relative to its peers, we might sell some of it because there's always probably going to be other places that are undervalued. Mm -hmm. So we could, we could sell something, look, take a trim, take a little off the top and put it in something that's undervalued. We've, we've done some of those uh, mechanics here, uh, but it's really fundamentally to the company or its, or its industry or something material about the business that would make us a seller You know, when we're dealing in a vacuum. We're not going to, again, it's not going to be, you're telling me the, the probability of recession is today it's 73%. Somehow that must mean we need to do something with our portfolio. It's, yeah. it's going to come down to the individual company. Yeah, any sale is going to be business specific. Um, I can't really see a scenario at Cordo where we say because of macro events or, or something like that, we're, we're selling 25% of all portfolios to raise cash. I mean, I suppose if, I suppose if we knew the market was going to sell off 10% in the next month um, and it hadn't done it yet, <laughs> we could do something like that, but that's just not the case. It's never the case. So um, it's going to be business specific. And Jeff, we wrote in a market update that went out uh, last a week ago, uh, that selling is very problematic. If you miss some of the biggest, best days in the market, and guys, you could all go back and look at your inbox. We emailed you a, a chart that talks about if you miss some of the best days of the market, your annualized returns come way off. So you kind of have to stay invested through thick and thin. Yeah, got to be right too if you sell. You got to be right. John, too. We look we look <laughs> forward to those best days in the market coming up. <laughs> Okay, we are out of time. John and Brian, thank you guys very much. We appreciate the update. We've had a great group, uh, as I see on the attendee list here, uh, join us. So uh, we really thank you guys as clients for joining us. This will be or was recorded. You'll get a link to that within the next 24 hours. Feel free to watch it again. Uh, if you don't get the link and you want it, you can email me, Jeff, J-E-F-F, -F, at CordaManagement.com. I'll get it to you. And uh, appreciate everybody being on today. We hope it was helpful. We'll keep the communication coming. And thank you. Have a great week. Guys, thanks, Bye, everybody. Guys.